Welcome everybody to a Christmas Eve edition of Radio Dead Air Tech Q&A. You've got questions, we've got guesses. Uh, I am Nash, I do RDA, I've been doing it for over almost, what is it, 17 years now? Um, I also have Sounds a like, yeah. long and storied history in the tech industry with me. It's my producer, Mike Gearman. He has an equally long and sundry connection to technology. How you doing, Mike? Not too bad. Not too bad. Merry Christmas, Mike. Merry Christmas, Nash. What did... yeah, I've been I've been involved in a little bit of trolling on Twitter today. What? what? Uh, not 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 much. There's a, I'm, a, a person I watch was was arguing with someone else and she made note that she was a Roman Catholic. So this first person uh, copied the Pontifex, which is the Pope's Twitter account on the tweets. At which point she told him to eat a bag of dicks, including the Pontifex. Very, very Catholic for Christmas Eve. Well, hello, Grady. Hello, Grady. You want to be on the show, too? Now you want to be on the show? Well, that that's very nice, Mike. That's lovely. I, I, I thought it was Christmas Eve. <laughs> So what did you? What have you gotten for Christmas? Um, not nothing really tech wise. I just asked for you know some stuff I needed. Strangely enough, when you turn into an adult, you ask for clothes. <laughs> Do you know what I got for Christmas? Um, hmm. Grady gave you a hairball. No. Good guess though. Yeah, I think him not giving me a hairball is a good Christmas. No, my 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 girlfriend Sarah. I love her, and she went way too far. She got you a holiday gift suit. No, she went. I'm just Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to show everybody what she got me for Christmas. She went way too fucking far. I I I feel ashamed. To receive this gift it is way too fucking far. Um, let me get the box here so you guys can all see. This is a GeForce GTX 1080 Extreme Gaming Water Force. Looks about like what I got. This is a water cooled. Okay, I don't have the water cooled me. Yeah, this is this is it has a built in closed loop water cooler. GeForce GTX 1080. It it overclocks up to 2.1 gigahertz. It has eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, it's VR ready. It has extra uh, HDMI ports. If I ever want to get one of those stupid GeForce goggles or or, or Vive or Oculus goggles. It's, it's too much. <laughs> this is, this is, I love her dearly, but this is too much. It's too much. Oh my God. And I got it installed, which is, it's, it is so quiet. It is, it is so quiet. It, it doesn't make a fucking say I love, that's the wonderful thing about water cooling. If you get a good one, it doesn't make a fucking sound. You have to have your head a foot away from the computer to even realize it's on. Cool. Yeah, no, I had that problem with, as well with, with when I got my new video card. Even, even though it's just air-cooled, compared to the fans in the old one, I'd be like, are those fans on? Is this thing gonna overheat and check on my computer? I don't. I don't hear anything. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're. You get so. We've gotten so used over the years to graphics processors <laughs> and and and, uh, and CPUs that require these massive, loud, buzzy fans. That when finally the technology is caught up to make these things um, quiet. We're we're scared of them because we're. It used to be that 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 was the noise that meant everything was okay. Yeah. Now we have no noise, and we're like, this thing's going to catch on fire, isn't it? Yeah. 
Oh. So yeah, that massive, incredible, you did too much for me. I love you, Sarah, but you did too much. Ah, uh, but speaking of guests, that's what the first thing we're going to be talking about on Radio Dead Air is tonight. We're not talking about Christmas. We're talking about the day after Christmas, of course, if you are in the UK or, or Canada. They do Boxing Day in Canada, right? Yeah, the 26th is Boxing Day, which I know this has been explained to me multiple times, and I always forget what the fuck Boxing Day actually means. All I know is you guys get an extra day off. And the reason, of course, we say to, to turn off your phone is because if you are technically inclined at all, then anyone you know who's got something they don't understand is going to call you. Yes. See, I, I, I have my work phone here somewhere. Uh, it's plugged into my computer so I can track it down and, and, and pull it back when I need to go back to work in a week. Um, and I know... And I'm going to walk into the office. People are going to go ask me, hey, how do I set up this? And I'll be like, is it a government piece of equipment? Oh, no, no, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, what happens on December 26 is every family and friend member you know who has received a shiny new tech present on December 25th and doesn't know how to work it will call you. What can you do? You can prep yourself a kit. Um, here's what I recommend to have on hand the day after Christmas if you are one of the tech-inclined people who gets asked for tech support. Number one. Vodka. Not helping, Mike. Number one, cables. There are, there are a number of common cables you can keep on hand just in case to test what's going on or just in case you're relative has got this nice shiny new device and doesn't realize it actually has to connect to something. I've fucking seen that before. Yes, far, and far too many things ship without the cable because they go, well, we could toss the cable in there. Mm -hmm. the packaging. It would cost us a whole extra dollar on our end to put in a cable because we're going to put in a cheap cable. Or we can make them spend an extra trip to Fry's or Best Buy or wherever to buy a cable that's going to cost them $20. Um, I recommend having on hand an HDMI cable. Have at least yes. one. And these are cheap as, as hell to get. You can get them online for, pen, for pennies on the dollar. Yeah, 5 to $10 for a, a good cable. Don't buy monster cables. You're paying, no. you know, you're paying Just... 500 extra percent. Yeah, go to Amazon, HDMI cable, an HDMI cable is an HDMI cable is an HDMI cable. Besides, this yeah. is just the get... Only, the, only, the only thing you need to check to make sure is that it has legitimate UL listing, so it's not a complete garbage cable right. that's going to set something on fire. Number two, a USB type, what is it, is, is it type A mini? Sure. Micro, um, micro, micro is the standard now, type A micro. Or just a rather... Worst case, buy one of those little USB connector kits where it's mm. got a plug on one end and you just plug, I plugs. Yeah. Oh, this one fits. USB micro. That's a very useful one. If you're having to deal with Apple products, make sure you have a USB to lightning cable because that is the current one you have to deal with for iPads and iPhones. And finally, it's kind of newer now, but it may come in handy, a USB type C cable. This yep. is the all-in-one all generic everybody cable that they want everyone to start using. However, make sure if... I, I would recommend going to Amazon and checking reviews before you purchase one of these because some of these are substandard and they're made to carry way more power than the older USB types. So if they're put together wrong, they could blow something up. Also, if you have a relative who calls you and says their new USB Type-C device has blown up, that's the first thing to check is to see what kind of cable they got. So Yes, or ask them if it's a Samsung uh, 7. Yes, Samsung Galaxy. Yeah, that, that's another one. Um, what else to check? 
The next thing is, and this is this might come in handy even if you're not doing tech-related stuff. This might come in handy just for you at home if you're not a tech-related person. When you buy a brand new laptop, you get a ton of ridiculous bullshit on it. Just, just tons and tons and tons of awful, useless crap programs. And it, it, it's, it's things like 30-day versions of something that might actually be useful for some people, but probably isn't for, you know, your parents or whatever. Um, if you want to put an extra antivirus on there, then yeah, okay, maybe you look at what comes there. Mm -hmm. It'll also come loaded down with uh, games. It may come loaded down with uh, various types of bloatware. I'm trying to think of what, what they come loaded with. And in Lenovo's case, in some of those were actual malware that yes. came pre-installed. Okay, so uh, it's a bit late for Christmas this year, but I, we've said it before in the show, don't buy Lenovo. Don't buy Lenovo. It's bad, bad, don't do it. Um, but if you have one of these brand new PCs, if someone you know has one of these brand new PCs, we can have, we have a recommendation for you. And I want to point out, I am not sponsored by these folks. They didn't give me anything. I just checked into the software. I liked it. And it seemed to be, it's, it's a good idea. And I'm glad someone did it. It's called PC Decrapifier. Yes. Their slogan is, and I love this, their slogan is, it's like TP for your PC. You can find it. You can find their stuff at PCDecrapifier.com. What this software does is it has... Hello, Grady. What are you doing? What is it? What is it, pal? You want to sit up there? Okay. Um, I blinked. Did he just jump up there? Yes, he did. He does that. Um, what this is is it has a list of known bloatware of common stuff that... You, and even me, who's been using this stuff all the time, I still have to wonder, is this supposed to be on the new computer or is this something they just put on? What they have done is they've compiled all those things that you do need this on the seat, on the new computer, you don't need this on the new computer. And it's all in the software. You just get the new PC, you run this on there, and most, the other, only other solution, what, stop it, Grady. He's being a little prick. The only other solution before now was to, um, what have you found? He's found something that makes noise and it's making him happy. Great. Knock it off. My cat, everybody. Um, <laughs> the, the only other solution before now was to... I'll talk as I go and take it away from him. He'll be pissed, but I don't care. <laughs> the only other solution before now, if you got a new PC with a bunch of this bloatware crap on it, was to completely wipe the PC and reinstall Windows. But since that's not a viable solution for most people, what the fuck was this? Was this did this come from the new P, the new graphics card? Why did you? <sighs> you can't leave trash for him. Um. Since most people don't have the wherewithal nor the just desire to completely reinstall their operating system when they get a new PC, this is a much, much better solution. And, um, and for some people, reinstalling their operating system means using the disk that came with it, which, which will just reinstalls the bloatware. Put all the bloatware back on. Now, if you do, in fact, need to reinstall Windows, you can do so with the uh, tool that's on Microsoft's website for Windows 10. And this applies to a brand new PC. It will automatically detect the licensing and everything on it. But something important to remember there, it will wipe out the licenses on all the other pieces of software. Like if you have a copy of Office on there, that will go away and you'll lose the key code. So th again, this is a much nicer solution. I recommend it to anybody who needs to to take care of this sort of thing. It, it, and, and, and also one of the features on there, it says, okay, here's the list of things we think should be removed. It doesn't remove stuff automatically. It says, no. here's the list of things we think should be gone. You pick which ones you want gone. Yep. So if they want, if they're, if, for example, if there's an NFL app loaded on there, I only say that because I know one's loaded on my phone. Uh, uh, and you say, I don't want that. 
it gets rid of it. But if you say, oh, I really like the NFL, I'll leave that on. It will leave it. Now, I don't know how well it works on dependencies. So if there was two or three pieces of crapware from the same company and you got rid of two of them, would the third one still work? I don't know. So, yeah, that that's... that's. But it's a price we're willing to pay. <laughs> so if you're getting new tech, that that's the best recommendations I can have. Have some cables on hand and also get this. This will help, especially with computer stuff. Apple, you're on your own. Whatever crap they put on there, you're on your own. But for PCs, you know. Yeah, and um, my list, of course, I mentioned vodka earlier. I'd also include some, some painkillers of your choice, Tylenol or Advil or that. that we hear at Radio stuff. Dead Air do not advocate the use of any sort of drugs or intoxicating or substances. Counter. And just because I've been there, a small first aid kit. <laughs> Because if you're taking apart or putting together parts yeah. of a computer, it is not impossible to cut yourself. Yeah. And at that point, you will also ask yourself the important question. When did I have my last tetanus shot? I will also finally recommend a last minute gift suggestion for anybody out there. This is something everyone will find a use for. A multi-bit ratchet screwdriver i agree with this i i will say don't spend more excuse me don't spend less than ten dollars on that because the ten dollar ones are really crap yeah. and fall apart but th this is this is sort of one of those things everybody should own one of these because you will net you will always be in one of those circumstances where if you get new furniture if you get new computer stuff if you get all kinds of things this comes in so handy. So here is a wonderful last minute. If someone you know doesn't have one of these, this is a nice gift to get them. I recommend getting one of these. It's 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 good to have around the house a, a simple multi-bit ratchet screwdriver. These come in so handy. You will not- They do. Yeah. And, my, and my last bit of advice for assembling stuff uh, over the holidays, if you get a tingling sensation on your hands, that's battery acid, go wash this. <laughs> That's not a common one, Mike. That's not a common. We're trying to do the common stuff here. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Let me just, and you want to wash your hands before you go to the bathroom. <laughs> anyway. Um, now for my own little Christmas present that I got. This story I've been following for upwards of five years. And we got a happy ending. It's a Christmas miracle. Hooray! You may be familiar with a company called Prenda Law. Run by... I have followed this one as well. It's been very entertaining. Run by a pair of lawyers, Paul Hansmeyer of Minnesota and John Steele of Florida. Because there has to be a Florida connection somehow in this mess. Here's what they did to recap very shortly. What these two assholes did was they figured out that by use of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and porn, they could extort people who downloaded things on BitTorrent and P2P networks. They figured out they could force ISPs or tried to force ISPs to turn over IP addresses to them, which they could then link to, well, they gave them IP addresses, they wanted subscriber information. They could then send out these extortion emails, which said, look, we're gonna take you to court over your copyright violation unless you pay us this much money and then we'll go away. Plus we'll tell everyone you were downloading Backdoor Sluts 3. Now one of their, one of their I'm gonna say neat ways they did this because they didn't go to a porn company no. and say, "Hey, we're gonna check out. We'd like to. We'd like to, you to hire us to find out who's downloading your stuff." Yes. No. What they did is they sort of made their own porn. They made their own porn and then deliberately put it on the Pirate Bay and other BitTorrent search. They set up honeypot traps, so they made their own shitty porns. And they put them up for download. Well, Nash, I, I was not going to speak to the quality of their pornography. 
Come on, this is this is a guy named Paul Hansmeier and John Steele. You know that's a shitty porn. Nobody named John Steele makes a good porn. I I, I bow to your superior knowledge in, in that regard. So yeah, the happy ending here is after many judges caught on to their little scheme and realized they were doing things like um, dodging attorney's fees and lying and sort well, of- it's, it's, It started of course with them going to like say an ISP and going, we want the IP addresses of these 900 people, one of which we think was in this area. Yeah. So that's why it's going in front of this judge. And the judge, the first judge they went in front of said, yeah, sure, whatever, because he didn't know any better. But then it started going in front of other judges who were going like, one of these people is in my jurisdiction, maybe. Why are you asking for 900? Yeah, the, the whole thing kind of unraveled. And now finally, they are being arrested and charged with filing false and abusive copyright claims that threaten individuals, fraudulent settlements, um, extortion, all sorts forgery, of forgery, identity theft. identity theft. They go into jail. Yeah, it's it, it, there was there was a third person involved in this that they were blaming for a lot of this, who, rather inconveniently for them, died. Yeah, they he did it. Paul Duffy, he's dead. They blamed everything on the dead. They literally blamed it all on the dead guy. Unfortunately, the judges aren't buying that. No, no, they aren't. So happy, happy Christmas, everyone. After years of terrifying and extorting and sending these letters to people, some people just getting these, it was a block of IP addresses. They may not even have been responsible for it. And they were getting these letters. After saying pay us, it was, it, it was not even a large amount. It was like $1,200 or things like that. That's a large amount, shit. Compared to what you can ask for under mm -hmm. copyright, it's not mm -hmm. a large amount. Because you, you can ask for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars under copyright, uh, depending on how much was done. Um, so someone gets a, pay us $1,200 or we're going to sue you and tell all your friends you were downloading porn. They actually had quite a few people go through with that. It was profitable for them. Mainly, but yeah, because it's, it's, it was extortion and it, they go into jail. Everyone going to jail. Yeah, the indictment, because there's, there's an indictment. You can find it online. It's 18 pages long. Details no less than 14 specific lies that were told under oath. Now, there's certain things you can do in front of a judge that may upset him, but he won't go after you. Lying to a judge is oh, they, not one of them. They don't like perjury. That makes them mad. You can, you can wear the wrong color suit or the wrong color tie, and they'll... Eh, whatever. You lie to them, all bets are off. They don't like the perjury that make them mad. Oh, uh, speaking of other companies who deserve it and are having legal problems, Uber. Yeah, I saw this one. Yes, this of course made made the, the the local news because it's well, it's California. Yeah, Uber is in California attempting to test, or they were attempting to test their self driving cars. Well, California is kind of used to this. There are a lot of tech companies out there who are in the process of doing this sort of thing. And California's DMV have, in fact, set up regulations and simple ways to do this. It's a I 100... Would, I, I wouldn't say simple, but, but to this, there's, there's a number of hoops you have to jump through, but they're not hoops that you can't jump through. Yeah, it's a questionnaire and a $150 permit you have to get from the DMV. And I want to say it's a 150 permit per car, but that yeah. may be a mistake on my part. Again, not the kind of money that is impossible for Uber. I know, Uber's got tons of money. Well, Uber flat out said, we're not going to do the permits, we're going to run the test anyway without getting a permit from the state of California. Yeah, and then the DMV came back and said, no, no, really, you need the permit, get the permit, and Uber said, no, we don't want to. And I don't see how Uber thought they could win this one. I really, it, it, that's what got me is I didn't see how they, you know, we don't want to do the thing you say we have to do. And you're people who can take our cars off the road. And that's exactly what they did. 
uh, yeah. the DMV in Florida revoked all California, 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 not Florida, California. Sorry. DMV in California revoked all the registrations for Uber self-driving test cars. They are no longer legal to be on the road at all, at all Even with a normal driver. Yep. Which if a cop saw that car on the road, it can actually be impounded now. Yes. Um, some people are suspecting the reason they didn't want to do this is that Uber didn't want to have to report um, when the software failed, when it, it, it went through red lights or failed to yield or stuff like that. The other thing is Uber wanted to be running these tests while picking up fares. Yeah. That's, um, I've used Uber. It's been convenient for me a handful of times. What? My car was broken. I needed to get from point A to point B, and they were cheaper than, faster than a taxi. Uh, however, using Uber, I'd be sitting there going, wait, there's no driver in this car. I mean, until it's improved and, and certified, and, and everything well i'd be like send me a different car they were going to have There's an no driver here. engineer sitting in the driver's seat to monitor it but what really came what really this comes down to is uber's corporate culture which has been from the beginning fuck the law we're going to do what we're going to do that has been when it came to getting to dealing with markets and being treated as taxis, which they fought. When it came to treating their employees as employees, which they're still fighting. Um, when it comes to labor regulations, when it comes to any law, Uber always does shit anyway and then says, if you don't like it, take us to court. Which is why I don't fucking use Uber. Use Lyft if you have to. I know you got Lyft out there. Probably. If you have, don't you fuck Uber. Use Lyft. Well, I, haven't, I haven't reinstalled Uber on my phone. I had it on my old phone. I haven't needed it since I got it. I mean, Lyft, I'm not really sure about Lyft's track record right now, but god damn it, at least they're not Uber. <laughs> but... So, yeah, what happened is Uber's not going to be able to test their self-driving cars in California, and they are they are in a huff. They're taking their to, their self-driving cars to another state. Yeah, they're going to Arizona, apparently. So, I'm sure that's going I to work out. I don't know what Arizona's rules for those things are. It's going to be interesting if they go, okay, we, we did phase one testing in California. We're starting phase two testing in Arizona. Oh, we've been kicked out of Arizona. We're going to Utah. And you know, if they slowly go from state to state to state, completing test phases. I'm actually a little bit worried about this because um, California has been used to having tech companies and working with tech companies, understanding that they keep a, they keep abreast of this stuff because you have the Silicon Valley, you have all of the you have San Francisco, you have all of the tech bubble is California. Well, there's a decent amount in Arizona too. But I'm not sure Arizona's legislation has kept up as aggressively as California's has. So if you're in Arizona and you're out driving, be fucking careful. Because there are stupid robot cars. Thanks to Uber. Good luck, Arizona. So... That's going to do it for the stories this week. But now we actually answer your tech questions. Um, just to, but what? I say, yep. Yeah. Just to remind you, if you want uh, Mike and I to try and help you out with the tech issue, go ahead and send those questions to requests at radio.air.com. And if at all possible, we might be able to give you some assistance with these things. Uh, let's start with a really simple one. Uh, this is from uh, Renee at the very, very bottom. Um, Hi, Nash, Mike, and Grady. A colleague of mine recently said that using antivirus software slows down your system and it would be beneficial to not install one. Is this true? Well, it does slow down your system. Anything you install on your computer is gonna slow down your system when it runs. That's the nature of programs. 
But yes, you do need an antivirus of some sort. Yes, you do! Now, we don't recommend certain antivirus softwares. Yeah. Because they're kind of crap. Sometimes. McAfee, uh, Norton's yeah. kind of gotten kind of bad. AVG has gotten really bad. Uh, Kaspersky, Copernicus, Kaspersky. I can never say it. I can never fucking say it. I'm going to look it up so I can pronounce it. Kaspersky. Kaspersky. I don't know about a vast anymore these days. Yeah. What you should definitely have on your computer, if you're running a Windows machine, make sure you have, uh, if you're running a latest version, Windows 7, 8, and 10. Oh, Windows 9, wherefore art thou? Make sure you at least have Windows Defender on there because that is a built-in antivirus. It's a fairly robust one. It's fairly quick. It has free updates. It will cover- And it's updated daily. Yeah, it's updated. So it will cover the basics. However, you need something running on your machine, especially if you're on a Linux machine, even on Apple these days. I'd recommend having some sort of antivirus protection on there because there are viruses and stuff being designed for Mac OS now. You got to have your colleague is trying to destroy your computer. Whoever your colleague is, they are not your friend. Like, fun are they your friend? That's not your friend. Uh, and yeah, and we don't know, I don't necessarily know what to recommend for Apple. I don't use Apple. Yeah. Um, I, I suspect that the major names out there make one for it. Um, but at worst case, go to the Genius Bar and say, hey, I need an antivirus. Yeah. Don't necessarily buy what they tell you, but find out what they what they recommend and what other names are. They'll be able to tell you some names. Yeah, least. get options. Always get options. But don't don't run your computer. Don't run your don't run anything. Especially even even your phone, really. Yeah. Don't run without antivirus. And it might sound kind of silly. I've got antivirus in my phone. It might sound kind of silly. It might sound like it takes up space and it's a waste of processing power. And yeah, it will make things a little slower. But running without it will destroy your computer. And possibly your life, depending on what malware gets on there. It's very expensive to not run without antivirus, especially when there are free options. Don't run your computer without antivirus. Your colleague hates you. That's all I can determine. Your colleague must hate you. Um, we've got a question here from Lance, another relatively simple one. Um, my Chromebook screen keeps going black every time I touch or move it. What's the problem and how can it be fixed? Update, I can get my screen to go back on if I fiddle with the brightness settings on my keyboard, but I would still like a more permanent solution, especially now the screen isn't even coming on immediately whenever I turn the computer on. That sounds like this, this screen cable. You've got a short. Um, this happens a lot with- Or, not or a disconnect. Or a disconnect or a short. Yeah, this happens a lot with laptops, not just the Chromebook, but with any kind of laptop. You, you have your laptop, it opens up like this, but there's a little cable that runs from the motherboard, where underneath the keyboard, up through the bend and into the back of the monitor, which is in this and, part. Yeah, and so that flex part, one, one of two things has happened here, either one end of the one end, or possibly both, of the cable has come a little bit loose and is mm -hmm. not connecting them. And you, you, when you say you fiddle with the brightness up, maybe that brightness button is right over where the cable connection mm -hmm. is. So when you push it, you reconnect the cable just enough for it to come back yeah. on. Or you're pushing it is causing the, the, the flex. Maybe there's a break in the flex that's just yeah. flexing it enough to reconnect. It uses this flat type of cable. It's it's very thin, very flat. It's almost like a sheet of paper. And they usually, and it, with, with Chromebooks, they're fairly durable, but yeah. with anything that you open and close a lot, you're gonna have eventually enough wear and tear happening along that flex to cause disconnect. It's exactly like the type of cable that goes from your monitor to your computer or from your uh, Blu-ray player to your television set. It is that type of cable, it's just in a different form factor. Instead of being a round cable, it's a flat piece of paper type cable. And just like any cable, if it gets a tiny little break anywhere in it, or if the connection on either end is a little bit loose, 
then you go up and you tap the cable. It'll work again for a second or two until it falls out of position, and then you're sunk again. Um, and there's there should be yeah, it looks like there's uh, replacement ribbon cables you can buy online and walkthroughs on how to do it uh, on YouTube and such. Uh, just make sure you put in the right model when you're when you're looking for this. And it looks like it's a fairly straightforward replacement. Now, what you're going to have to do, if you, I, I take it you're not a very tech-oriented sort of person. Unfortunately, the fix for this means you're going to have to take it to either to contact uh, Google and see about um, sending it in for a warranty repair because Chromebooks are... How recent are Chromebooks? They're still within two or three years, right? Yeah, yeah, you might still be under warranty. You might still be under warranty. Or you may have to pay for a repair, or you're going to have to take this to a store, a reputable local computer store. Anyone who says they're willing to try and, and look to, to do this repair for you. Um, yeah. But you, this is not, for most people, this is not a home repair. You, you could try it yourself, but if you don't know what you're doing with laptops, there are tons of tiny little screws. There are plastic hinges and snaps. There's a yeah. lot of stuff you're going to have to do here. If you don't mind losing the whole thing on accident, have fun. Look for a Google Chromebook teardown. Google search for that online. And make sure you say there's, since there's several models. There's HP, there's Samsung, there's Acer. Uh, I want to say there's a Lenovo Chromebook. Um, so make sure you're looking at the right model when you're doing your teardown. Uh, and, uh, yeah, depending, depending on the model, the cable replacement could be very simple and straightforward. Uh, or it could be, you have to take the whole computer apart. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, just not a, not a Chromebook, but there was a Dell I had at work where the, uh, the similar cable was a five minute replacement job to do. Mm-hmm. And the keyboard was a five-minute replacement job to do, which came in handy because I had to replace both of them on one machine. Uh, and on an HP, it's like, how do I fix this cable? Oh, take the whole thing apart. Yeah, that some sounds like HP. Some of them are built where you have to take the entire computer to pieces to replace a very simple. Laptops are a very specialized type of repair. If you're willing to go for it, Lance, by all means, just understand. It's a headache. I hate working on laptops. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. It's doable. It's something I can do, but it's a pain in the ass. Okay, let's see. But yeah, first check your warranty. You might still yeah. be under warranty. You might still be under warranty. And if so, this is definitely the sort of thing warranty covers because this is, the, unless, unless you dropped it and there's a big ass crack running through the plastic or something, you should be fine. Um... Let's look for uh, Josh's question here. Okay. This is getting a little bit more technical here. This is for PC builders. Um, I'm currently researching to build a new computer. First question I have have is about motherboards. I think I can safely go without a Z7 uh, 170 chipset. Now we're talking about chipset stuff. I'll explain that in a second. Um, which would push me past my $850 budget target. Stuck with a choice between a micro ATX H110 chipset and an ATX H170. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure the H10 will get the H110 will get the problem done with no uh, job done with no problem. My question is: Is it worth it to get an H170 if there are any problems with micro ATX? I should be current concerned about. All right. Um, for me, it's always been a form factor issue with the ATX boards. You're you're more likely to find a drop-in replacement if you decide to upgrade motherboards mm -hmm. later. With the micro, you're looking at going, um, I got to find something that fits this. Mike, pause. Bring it back a second. Okay. You always jump to the end. Most people have no idea what we're talking about right now. Okay, sure, sure. We're, we're talking to everybody. Remember, we're talking to everybody. What we're talking about here when we talk about chipset and ATX. First of all, chipset is... Think of your the motherboard of your computer as the nervous system of your computer. It's like your spine. It allows every single device inside the computer to communicate with the brain. It's where all the nerves 
click into, the brain being the CPU of your computer, it allows everything to talk to one another. Yeah. The more... And, and the chipset, the, the various chips that control uh, expansion slots and uh, all the other components ha have different capabilities. Right. So a different chipset, you know, he mentions uh, the H170 and the H110, will have different, like, speeds or different <laughs> uh, bandwidths and different different things hanging off. Them. Right. One At, might have more expansion slots than the other, for example. Typically, they run in a low tier, a mid tier, and a high tier. The low tier is what you could get by with in an office computer. It'll run everything you need. It'll do web browsing just fine. It'll probably even do Netflix just fine. It'll do office work just fine. Yeah. Because you won't have a lot of expansion cards that you need to put off of there, and you won't have necessarily a lot of high-end computing such as right. graphic design and things like that. And it, when you do in an office environment, it'll generally be, oh, look, the office guys have their model of the computer, and the graphic design people have their own different high-end model. The mid-tier is where we get into stuff like um, more bandwidth available for graphics. So if you want to upgrade your video card later, that's what you want to look into. It's, it's the sort of thing that a regular gamer could get by with just fine. It also includes stuff like additional USB ports um, and control for faster uh, hard drives and other little bells and whistles and sometimes even stuff like uh, better audio. Um, yeah. So that's what the mid the or, mid tier... Or an encryption chip built in on the motherboard. Sometimes right. low-end ones don't include that. The mid ones do. So at the mid-tier, that's about where most people who, especially if you want to game with a computer, that's where you need to be. The high end is for the crazy motherfuckers. This is where you will have multiple tons of USB uh, connectors. You will have M2 plugins for super high speed hard drives. You will have 40 different PCIe lanes for triple SLI video cards. You will have all sorts of crazy shit. Overclocking, overclocking is only, at least with Intel, overclocking is only available on the high end. This is the crazy end of things. Um, now, what we're talking about here, the Z170 is the high end, and that says he was going to blow his budget on that. Don't even worry about it. Um, the H110 is the low tier, and that's for office work, and the H170 is for the mid tier. And that's where I would go for this build. Yeah, I know it will cost you a little bit more, but if, you, if you're if you thinking about expanding in the future, if you want to hold on to this computer for a few years and be able to add more stuff to it, better video cards, better hard drives, more memory, the H170, that would be the one to go with. Now, the other thing he mentioned here was ATX and micro ATX. What we're talking, when you hear the term ATX, all this really means is the form factor of the motherboard. Yeah. That is... How big, what shape it is. The shape and where the screw holes are. This has become standardized. It used to be anything goes with, with motherboards back in the day. But as time has gone by, they, these have become standardized. ATX is the universal standard. ATX is, is the full-size one. Micro ATX will fit in an ATX case. It's just a little bit small. Um, are there any problems with micro ATX? The smaller boards, they don't have as many expansion slots. Sometimes they don't have as many memory slots. Is that going to be a problem for you? That's just something you're going to have to ask yourself. Do you need like SLI later on to put in multiple video cards? Do you need to expand your memory later? That's... Uh, to give you an idea, just, just to, uh, for example... Um... The H110 uh, has four SATA slots available for hard drives. The H170 has six. That's something. Now, are you going to have four or six hard drives hanging off there? Well, no, probably not. But in case you do, uh, H110 has no PCIe mm -hmm. available slots. Right. And the H170 has two. Now, the second... So, in terms of whether you're going to have a problem with the, with the form factor... No, nah. micro ATX will be fine. Chipset matters more. It all depends on how much you want to expand later. I just would get, I'd get an H1. I would not get the low tier chipset. I would get the H170. That's the mid tier. So 
The other part of his question is, second question I have is how much in, how an integrated GPU works. Ooh. According to my research, the integrated GPU on the i5-6500 is superior to the one he currently has. What can I expect from performance in an integrated GPU? And is it worth it to use for light gaming until I get in a dedicated video card looking at either an RX 480 or GTX 1060? Let's go to basics here. Do you want to go to basics or? Oh, uh, go ahead. All right. I was, I was just going to say the integrated video kind of sucks. Yeah. GPU, graphics processing unit. That is, in modern computing, that is, when it comes to games, the GPU does most, for most games, it does most of the work. Yeah. Graphics processing does all the drawing, it does all the, the special little bells and whistles, all the shading, all the 3D stuff. Um, and Intel has made great strides with what's called the integrated GPU. When they make your the brain of your computer, the CPU, Intel has included its own little tiny GPU on there as well. So you don't really need one to put in a slot to run things. Yeah, and if you're, if you're in an office environment, you don't have generally a video card. And with most laptops, this also comes in handy too, because it's lower power, it doesn't require much more system resources, it's cheaper to do. The downside being is it's not very powerful. When you hear someone talk about integrated graphics, it means it's built in, it's fixed, and it was cheap to throw on there. It will get the job done. That's it. Now, Intel has made a lot of progress with this. And they are much better than they were, say, five years ago. Yeah. You could probably run it with modern games and be able to play the game. You wouldn't be, you know, seeing everything you could possibly mm -hmm. see. You wouldn't be getting the frame rate that you uh, dedicate a video card. And if you're playing, say, uh, you know, a, a cooperative or competitive game, you're probably not going to win. No. With this particular, I, I've looked up some stats on it with this particular one, and this probably holds true for most stuff. We, we're talking about an integrated graphics processor. You could, at best, run a game at 720p. You won't be running it in 1080. Just forget that idea right off the bat. You can run most stuff in 720p with a, all of the uh, effects stuff, the graphics options turned to low. So you'll probably get 30 frames per second, likely, fingers crossed, with all the settings turned down, it won't look as pretty. Yes. Eventually. In some games, I'm not saying it's, 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 this happens in games like Warcraft. Mm -hmm. In some games, you will not be able to tell you're standing in the fire because you're not seeing the full effect. Right. So it will get you by until you can afford to get a better graphics card. You can play. It's just when you finally do get a better graphics card, a when we say integrated, the opposite of that is dedicated. A dedicated graphics card is a card that plugs into your computer and it just runs graphics. Yep. Um, and in this case, you mentioned the RX 480 or the GTX 1060. I would lean toward the 1060 price performance. It's going to be good. You will be happy with that one, you, especially you'll be able to run just about everything at 1080p without too much problems. The 1060 is is the best value for the money right now. So, yes. So I hope that helped you out, Josh. So very in-depth on that one. Um, oh, I got an interesting one from Gelly here. We'll, we'll add, I, I was hoping we get to this question. This is a crazy-ass question. I love this. As you and many others know, uh, TV and other forms of media often get technology wrong. Recently, I was reading a series that involved people super clocking their computers for some type of competition. I have no idea if this is a real life thing. It's not one I wanted to ask about. What I want to ask is if some sort, uh, some of these people are how it is about how some of these people are cooling their computers. Basically, they were using liquid nitrogen and dry ice to cool their computer. How feasible is that? Okay, yes. Yes, you could theoretically do that. And I'm sure there's probably some government facility out there that does. Actually, not a government facility. There are overclocking competitions that are regularly held. Okay, well, that's more your wheelhouse than I am. Okay. This is a thing that actually happens. High-performance overclocking. 
I'm going to give you a brief overview of overclocking right now. And you might you might have heard of this. But let, let me say one thing before Nana starts. Liquid nitrogen is a very dangerous thing to play with. Do not use it at home, kids. When I say it's very dangerous, when you move uh, canisters of liquid nitrogen from, say, one floor of a building to another in an elevator, the way you do it is you put the canister in the elevator, you lean in, you push the button, and you have someone up at the other floor wait for it. You're not supposed to be in the elevator with it at the same time. Yeah, it's it's not it, okay. Because if it were to spill, you die. Not from the freezing. It, you just lose all oxygen. Brief o oh, brief overview of overclocking. A CPU and in some cases a GPU, like we were just talking about, um, has a certain set speed. This involves how much power it's able to take in and how many instructions it's able to run in a single clock cycle or per second, depending on how you measure it. That's when you hear someone say something like they have a three gigahertz processor, a 3.5 gigahertz processor. That's how much, that, that, that's the frequency at which clock instructions are run. That's where they're sold at because they test the chips, they see what, what they can handle and what they're rated for to specifications. And that's the, the speed they're sold at. And if something fails a test, it goes, okay, well, it couldn't run it this fast, but run it this fast. Okay, we'll sell it this level. Oh, these, you know, so basically if it passes this much tests, it's sold at this level, this much tests, it's sold next level, and so on and so on. Now what? Why they're more expensive as you go up. Now what overclocking does is you go into the settings of the CPU or the GPU, and you tell it to run faster than it's rated to run. This can work. This will lower the, the total life expectancy of a CPU or a GPU, but considering how long these things are made to last anyway and how quickly they go obsolete, it might be worth it. It's a good way to take a cheap uh, little processor and get more value out of it. The downside is it often requires more power to run through the chip, higher voltage, and when you run more power, through a, a semiconductor, through silicon components, they get hotter. You have to do have some way to disperse that heat. There are a lot, now you already have in most computer, on just about every computer, you already have some sort of heat sink and fan to disperse the heat on the processor you already have. Even your laptop has this. That's why your laptop has a fan in it. People have gone a little bit further than this. They use liquid cooling. It's essentially a setup just like in your car a water-cooled radiator. I've got those in my computer. Especially if you're overclocking, this comes in handy because it allows the processor to run cooler. Now, when you talk about the overclocking competitions, when people see if they can run the chip to the absolute breaking point possible, that's when, liqu that's when liquid nitrogen and dry ice come into play. These are highly customized rigs that are set up by people who do this for a, this is what they, they can win money. You can win money at overclocking competitions. Intel and AMD sponsor them. So does NVIDIA as well. They, they have, these are a thing. They will hook up the computer. They will crank the processor far beyond anything it's rated to do. And they will pipe on these specially constructed liquid nitrogen rigs to keep the processor from self-destructing. Just essentially, these are proof of concept things. Also, I am sure there are some laboratories, there are some special research facilities that do need to run processors way beyond their rated specifications. So there are probably also, they do have liquid nitrogen cooled computers, especially we're talking supercomputers when we're talking um, developing the next generations of computers, we're tra talking all of that sort of thing. These quite possibly, I I'm pretty sure these are fairly in use regularly as well. Um, is it possible to do? Yes. It is- You can do it at home. No. No, do not. Whatever, you, you are not a professional. Do not do this shit. Is it feasible? If you have more money than cents, yes it is. If you know what you're doing and you can win overclocking competitions and win money off of it, yes. Um, 
so yes, it is technically possible to do. It is done on a regular basis. It is just not something that... The whole point of overclocking is to get more for less, is to get more value out of a processor you've purchased by running it hotter and offset that heat without spending a whole bunch of extra money. Using liquid nitrogen is ridiculously expensive. You're, it runs out like that. It, it literally just vaporizes. It's gone. So in terms of over, it's more of a proof of concept than something that's actually worth money to do. So the answer is yes, crazy people can do this. <laughs> And so, yes, it can, if it appears in a book and it, yeah, it, it's possible, but you, you don't, you're not going to see someone showing up to a, a standard gaming competition with a liquid nitrogen rig. If they are, they're going to be asked to leave. They should be, yes. You're making everyone nervous. Your computer is smoking. Could you step us? No, man, I got to get the frag rate. I got to get my frags in. My, my friend, fuck you, noobs. There's smoke coming out of your computer. That's the smoke of victory. No, 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 no. Th th there is nothing you could require to th that. No, it's, it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it, it goes against the whole idea of trying to get more for less. That's the whole point of consumer overclocking. This, it's possible but, oh, okay, the Hadron, uh, I'm being told the uh, the Hadron Collider computers are liquid nitrogen cooled. So yeah, in yeah. research, yeah, that that's when, that makes sense to do it because that's one of a kind research and they have millions of dollars. We do not have millions of dollars. That, you, you should not do this, so. All right, that's going to wrap it up tonight for uh, Tech Q&A. Thank you for joining us all on this Christmas Eve. Thank you for bearing with us with our sound issues. Um, if you have questions for next time, we'll be back in two weeks. Send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We will endeavor to answer those questions for you. Um, uh, Mike, you got anything else for tonight? Uh, no, I think that's it. Okay. Merry Christmas, everyone. Yes. Happy holidays. For Mike and myself, have yourself a happy, uh, Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Festivus, Solstice, whatever you've been celebrating. Enjoy it and a happy new year. We'll see you back here in 2017.